Okay, so first uh, system descriptions. Um, so we have actually a couple of different ways to describe a system that will completely characterize the system. Now, it doesn't give us the input, but given an input and the system description, we can calculate the output. There's another piece, the initial conditions on the system that may be present. And we'll talk about that today, but H of T is enough to completely characterize the system, to give us the structure of the system, to give us the relationship between the input and output, that differential equation. Equivalent to H of T is H of S, the Laplace transform, the, tra the transfer function, or the frequency response, or the linear constant coefficient differential equation relating the input and output, or the poles and zeros. Knowing the poles and zeros will allow you to reconstruct the transfer function. And then finally, given an output or an in, a given input, we know that we can find H of S, take the Laplace transform of both, take that ratio. Uh, so as an example, In this problem, and I think in some of the homework problems, in some cases they may give you the differential equation or an input output pair. But in this problem, we're given the impulse response and asked to then find all the other system descriptions. So um, we started out the course actually working with the impulse response. Um, but I was, giving it, I was giving the impulse response to it in most problems. Um, now we've got a technique for finding the impulse response. It's actually to use circuit analysis to come up with the transfer function. It's not often easy, but we can come up with the H of S using circuit analysis and then take the inverse transform to get H of T. But H of S. That's easy to get from the impulse response. It's just the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of delta t is one, of e to the minus t, u of t is one over s plus one, then that's times six. And then in this case, we have minus two over s plus two. You can combine all of those, put them over a common denominator, plus 12, s cubed plus sorry, s squared plus 3s plus 12. We can factor the numerator and denominator into s plus 3 and s plus 4. my own writing s squared plus 3s plus 2. So I write this term as um, s plus 1 times s plus 2 over s plus 1 times s plus 2 squared. Multiply numerator and denominator here by s plus 2. Multiply numerator and denominator there by s plus 1. And you've got them all over a common denominator. And can add them together. So I skipped a couple lines of algebra, but you know, this is the result. We typically try and write it as a rational function of a polynomial. And then now if we had the input, you know, we take the Laplace transform of x of t, multiply it by this, do a partial fraction expansion, and then and then get the output function. Um, equivalently from h of s, in particular this form, we can get the differential equation relating the input and output. The denominator corresponds to the output terms. Everywhere we have an S that corresponds to a derivative. So the S squared would be dy squared dt squared plus 3 dy dt plus 2y. And then the numerator gives us 
um, are, are the right hand side or the input side of the differential equation. Here it's dx squared, second derivative of x, um, plus 7 times the first derivative of x, plus 12. Can yet another way to describe this system? The relation between relationship between the input and output of the system. Another way is, you know, if I know I've got in this case I've got a pole at s equal minus one and s equal minus two. Uh, is that a stable system or unstable system? Stable, right? Both poles are in the left half plane, they have a negative real part. In this case, the poles are entirely real. The zeros are entirely real here as well, at s equal minus three and s equal minus four. So knowing the pole zero locations, I can reconstruct this. Right? If I know I've got a zero at s equal minus four, that means I've got an s plus four term in the numerator. The only thing that's left out of there is if there's a constant here, I, I couldn't reconstruct that constant term just from the pole zero location. So it's not quite the same as, doesn't, I don't quite have the same information from the pole zeros as I do from um, all the other descriptions. I could be off by a constant. But you know, pole zeros give me the, the same information uh, for h of omega. I just substitute, uh, assuming the system is causal or physically realizable, I just substitute in j omega for f. So that's all I have to do to get go from the transfer function to the frequency response. So here I'm going to have a minus omega squared plus 7 j omega plus 12. And then here I have the denominator, I have minus omega squared plus 3 j omega plus 2 would be the frequency response. Again, but by replacing j omega with s, I can go back to the transfer function. And then finally, yet another way is if I knew the response to any particular, to any input, Minus three, sorry. Minus three t u of t minus e to the minus four t u of t. Well, I think this was this was just uh, the example given in the book. You could pick any input. You know, u of t and e to the minus t u of t. You know, cosine. Anything for which we've got a, a Laplace transform anyway at this point. Now, our, our approach would be to calculate x of s, the Laplace transform, multiply by h of s to get the Laplace transform of the output, and then find the inverse transform. I'm not going to go through all of those steps. I've done that in the past, but in this particular case, y of t is, that, that's my, so it's time for 310 to start, but my watch, my watch must be off. I don't know what that was about. Uh, the output is e to the minus t u of t minus e to the minus 2t u of t. But given y of t and x of t, for any input output pair, again, I can reconstruct h of s. How do I do that? I can find x of s. I can find y of s. h of s, then, is the ratio of y of s to x of s. So this is kind of, I think, the most surprising one. It doesn't matter what input you feed the system. You'll get some output, and the Laplace transform of those will always give you the same h of s function. I mean, it's not surprising that that's the purpose of the transform. That that's the ratio of those two. So one thing we have not talked about yet is 
handling initial conditions on our system. So, so let's let's talk about that. And talk about the, the total response. So and there's a couple of different ways to break down the, the complete response. The method we're using of the, the zero state response, which I'll abbreviate ZSR, and then the zero input response. And the impulse response and the transfer function are both determined assuming all the initial conditions on the system are zero. And so what we've been com computing, or calculating using convolution or taking y of s and uh, finding y of s by multiplying h of s by x of s, that's, that's getting the output assuming all initial conditions are, are zero. So y of t equal h of t convolved with x of t or the other method, equivalent method, yields the ZSR. And I'll abbreviate that like that. Y with the subscript ZSR. Uh, and this is, again, all we've essentially been doing to find the other component the zero input response so we want to go back and look at this system assuming our input is zero but we've got initial conditions again this, this is one way to approach this problem and get the, the total response this this is what we're doing in this course we have Go back, go back to the linear constant coefficient differential equation. At least today, that's the approach we want to take. On Monday, I'll show you a, a circuit analysis approach, one you've already seen back in circuits too. But but the total solution is then the sum of these. The zero state response and then the zero input response. Okay, so let's let's look at an, an example problem. Three point four nine. So it's a fairly simple circuit, just a, an RC circuit. We're, our output is the voltage across this capacitor. Uh, the input is a voltage. The resistance is a 250 kilo ohm resistor. The capacitance is a, is a one microfarad capacitor. And we want to find the response to X of T equals 25 cosine of 3T U of T. And this is what we've been doing up to this point. Okay, the, the new thing is let's find the response, though, assuming that there's an initial voltage on the capacitor that's equal to two volts. Okay. So somehow we've charged up that capacitor, it's got two volts on it. Now we turn on our input voltage. Essentially, what we've been computing in the past up to this point is the same problem that y of zero uh, is equal to zero. So to get the complete response, first we'll do the, the zero state response, which is the part we know how to do. So H of S we can just get by, by voltage division. The impedance of the capacitor is one over SC. 
over the total series impedance, R plus 1 over SC. If you multiply through by uh, SC, you'll get 1 over SRC plus 1. Or we normally like uh, uh, this polynomial to have a unity coefficient and the leading term. I'm going to divide the RC out. So that's kind of our standard form. And then the values given, this is 4 over S plus 4 is the transfer function of this RC circuit. And it's, a, it's the ratio of the Laplace transform of the output to the Laplace transform of the input. The impulse response is going to be 4 times e to the minus 4 T U of T. It's the, just the inverse Laplace transform of that. This particular problem, x of s is the Laplace transform of the cosine is 25s, s squared plus 3 squared. And then so y, now I'm going to put a subscript on this, although this is what we've just been calling y up to this point because We've been assuming our initial conditions are zero, but our, our zero state response is H of S, X of S. And so multiplying those together, Y of ZSR of S is 100 S, the 25 times the 4 over the S plus 4 times the S squared plus 3 squared. Now we want to go back into the time domain to find y is e s r of t. So partial fraction expansion. You know we're going to have the something over the s plus four. That term turns out to be minus sixteen. Um, And then for the s squared plus 3 squared term, keeping that as in that form, because it's got complex, it's got uh, roots on the imaginary axis, at plus or minus j3. And then that term turns out to be 16s plus 36. Or Rewriting it one more time, minus 16 over s plus 4. Then we'll have, looking at our Laplace transform table, 16s over s squared plus 3 squared. And then for the constant term, we want to write that as 12 over 3 times s squared plus 3 squared. This will be our sine term and our Laplace transform table. Our cosine term is omega zero over s squared plus omega zero squared. So, so now we can finally get yzsr of t, and it's minus 16 e to the minus 4t plus. 16 cosine of 3t plus 12 sine of 3t. One more step. Because these are the same frequency, you know, we can combine them. This is a 16 minus j12 phaser. So y. ZSR of T is minus 16 even minus 14 plus 20 cosine 
or 3T minus 36.87 degrees times U of T. And nothing new here except I'm just calling this thing now the zero state response instead of previously we just called it Y of T. Just notice though that the zero state response here at zero would be at zero plus is minus 16 plus 20 cosine of minus 36.87 degrees. And if you plug it on your calculator, you'll find that that's equal to zero. And that's because in this particular case, we're, we're finding the voltage across the capacitor. And with this approach we've been using, it, is, uh, it assumes that all capacitors are uncharged and that there's zero current flowing through all inductors. And because the voltage across the capacitor can't change instantaneously, we have zero volts across the capacitor immediately after this. So this, this is actually the approach we've been taking all along. It's not correct, because okay. we're given this, this information that the voltage across the capacitor before we apply the input is actually two volts. So it should be two volts immediately after we turn on at y equals zero plus as well. We can't change instantaneously. So how do we find the zero input response? That's, that's the other piece of the puzzle. So what we're going to do is, is take this approach. Go back to the transfer function, because it's relatively simple. From that, get the differential equation, dy dt plus 4y is equal to 4x in this case. And to find the zero input response, Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to let the input be zero. So I'm going to let x of t be <coughs> zero. Essentially, and all derivatives would be zero. Okay, if there were derivatives. I'm setting the whole right hand side to zero. Now, differential equations, what did you call this? Do you remember that? We set the input to zero, found the response. What, don't remember it all? Well, I don't know. They call it the homogeneous solution back when I was at Does that ring a bell? They had to have, you had to find the homogeneous solution and then the particular solution. Again, now our approach is a little different, but I'll, I'll talk about the differences in just a minute. So, but this is like finding now the, the homogeneous solution, okay. uh, the R zero input response. Uh, so our differential equation becomes dy dt plus 4y now equals zero. And then now apply the Laplace transform. Now there's, in the Laplace transform, if you look in your handout, you know, we, um, there's another term here in the Laplace transform when you find the Laplace transform of a derivative that involves the initial condition. And this is what we're utilizing to actually take into account this, this initial condition. So if you'll notice for the Laplace transform of the derivative, it's of dy dt, it's sy minus y of zero minus, and then we would have this way, sy of s, and then plus four y of s is equal to zero. 
So now we're including this term because we want to find the response due to this initial condition. So, so our approach is, it's, it's kind of like superposition. We're going to find the output due to the input, assuming zero initial conditions. And then we're going to find the output due to the initial conditions, assuming no input. And then we'll add them together to get the, the, the total response. So here, I'm just going to take this constant term to the other side, factor out y of s, uh, s plus 4 is equal to y of 0 minus, or y of s is y of 0 minus over s plus 4 y of 0 minus was given as 2. And so now I want to take the inverse Laplace transform of this, but I'm going to put the subscript on this now. This is actually, I should have maybe had this on all the lies, but I just didn't want to bother to write it. This is not the total solution, this is the zero input response. The response due to initial conditions with the input zero. But this is pretty simple. It's just 2 e to the minus 4t u of t. Now notice this does satisfy the initial condition. With t equal to 0, this is equal to 2. With t equal to 0 plus, this is equal to 2, which I know the voltage across the capacitor has to be 2 volts at 0 plus because it's 2 volts at 0 minus. So the, the total. We're almost done. The total response is y of t is the zero state response plus zero input response. I finally get adding these together. Um, there we go. I've got the minus 16 plus the 2. I can write that as minus 14 e to the minus 4t plus 20 cosine of 3t minus 36.87 for the, the, the total response of this system. Um, so any questions on any of this? I know it's, I know it's a lot. There's a lot of there's a lot of, of equations on the board here today, and went through a lot of it pretty quickly. But again, it was really nothing new up until this point, where based on our circuit analysis, we go back to the transfer function. And that gets a differential equation, and then just zero out all the input terms so that we can include the initial conditions. And then resolve for y, and then add those two components together. So, in order to compare this to, to some of the other terms that you may have heard in differential equations, um, the zero input response is a sum of what are called mode terms. Determined by H of S. The only mode term here is actually this e to the minus 4t. It's determined completely by our H of S. It's, the, it's really the terms that make that are in the impulse response. Those are the, the mode terms. They'll always they'll, uh, make up a part of the total solution. You see that e to the minus 4t. But that e to the minus 4t is from the transfer function. We'll always have that regardless of what the input is. The cosine term is because our input was a cosine. The input had been like an e to the minus 60, we would have had an e to the minus 60 term in the output. 
and that would be part of what we call the particular solution. So the zero state response actually consists of mode terms plus terms that depend on that depend on the input. So what about some other terms you, you heard of in your differential equations class? Um, you may have heard of the terms of natural and forced response. Sometimes these are called the homogeneous and particular responses. And this actually breaks the problem down differently, the, the total solution down differently. The natural response consists of all mode terms. And then the force response is essentially the rest. Okay, so if you look at our total solution, We've got um, minus 14 e to the minus 4t, and then plus 20 cosine of 3t minus 36.87 uh, u of t. This is the natural response. This then is the forced response or the particular solution. But notice it's not quite the same as our zero input and zero state response because the natural response actually is made up of a term from our zero state response. There are mode terms in our zero state response. There are actually mode terms in our zero input response. Actually, this mode term is present to ensure that, in this case, y0 plus is zero, that, there, that uh, the uh, initial state is zero. So, but both of them have mode terms, and together they form what are called the, the natural response. So, in your uh, differential equations class, you're usually calculating these mode terms. You calculated a particular solution. You would leave this an undetermined coefficient, an unknown variable like a. Right? You'd find this particular solution and you'd write this down for the total solution. Then you would apply an initial condition at zero plus to determine this value. Um, our approach is a little different because we, we're using, you know, we're dealing with uh, inductors and capacitors and their voltages don't change. So we typically do a circuit analysis before we throw the switch to find out what our initial voltages are, what our initial currents are through inductors. And we know they have to be the same. And differential equations class, they typically tell you that Y is zero plus is equal to two, right? Don't relate it to any sort of physical problem, any circuits problem. So the terminology is a little different. Um, the, the other term you may hear, you may hear the, the transient response versus the steady state response. You know, here this is the transient response, the part that fades away, and this is what's left, the steady state response. Um, but that's a little different because, you know, if our input's in e to the minus 6t, we're not going to get a cosine term. In that case, the complete output would decay away. And then some texts define actually the natural and forced responses a little different, so that can be confusing. So, again, just uh, some slight differences between the approach we're taking 
and what you did in your differential equation. I wanted to show you one thing and then I'll I'll let you go. It's a Friday. I want to get home. It's been a long week. It, it's nice to actually be able to verify you know, we are now working with circuits trying to get back into circuits and it's nice to be able to verify our solutions well, one way to do that would be to actually build the circuit. And we've got uh, this particular input. You know, I think it was a cosine at a frequency of looks like was it three hertz or something. Um, um, and then measure the output using the scope. Now, with the, if you take that approach, you're probably going to miss the transient part portion of the solution and just see the steady state. Because by the time you look at it on the oscilloscope, this, this part's gone. But so in LT spice, then you have to you have to you know make the tool fit the actual problem. Uh, the default sinusoid in LT spice is a sine wave. But there, if you shift that to the left by 90 degrees, it becomes a cosine, which I think is what we had in the problem. And then uh, also um, it requires what is this? I guess this is the amplitude. Was it 25? Then what was the frequency of our? Oh, so the frequency. So the amplitude. This is the output. The amplitude of the input is 25, and it has a frequency of three radians per second. Well, LT spice wants the frequency in hertz, right? So just divide the three by two pi. Instead of doing that on my calculator and punching in the, the number in hertz, I just said LT spice do it. As long as you put it in braces, LT spice will do the math for you. The 250 kilo ohm resistor, the one microfarad capacitor. The way you specify initial conditions is in the capacitance value, a space, and then IC equals two. And this means that the initial voltage is, is two volts. You have to be careful because it's not clear. You know, if you use the UE symbols, they have they, they indicate that this is the positive terminal. But if you use the default capacitor, it doesn't tell you. You, know, you put a two here. Well, is it two from bottom to top or top to bottom? But in the circuit, we know it was specified as being two volts from top to bottom. So, in the the UE symbols have these little arrows on them to indicate the default polarities. So this is how you indicate the initial condition. And then we want to do a transient analysis to see the plot, the y voltage as a function of time. And that's hard to see. It's a little thicker line, but um, you'll notice it looks a little funny here at the beginning before it settles down. That's the transient response. Notice it does start here initially, actually at two volts. It looks like, okay, which was required to. And then also notice that you know eventually after it settles down, it looks like some sort of it's just some sort of sinusoid with a peak voltage of 20 volts. Actually, there, there are two um, graphs here. The red graph is actually the theoretical equation. Okay, the 14 e to the minus 14 plus 20 cosine. The blue graph, which underlies the red graph, is actually the LT spice simulated voltage. So since they overlap, you can be pretty confident that We've got the right solution. 
disappears. And you, you can verify using LT Spice the root cubic's problems that uh, you've got the right solution. On the, on the back of the handout, and I'm not going to take the time to go through this, you can use Octave or MATLAB to actually solve the differential equation with initial conditions. And it's the same thing. The MATLAB code is, most, most of that code is actually plotting stuff. MATLAB has a differential equation solver built in. That's the ODE45. And, you know, you have to set up the function, feed it in there, but then that produces the plot on the back. And again, it's got the numerical solution to the differential equation, as well as the theoretical solution. So, again, you can use MATLAB or LT Spice to verify your theoretical solutions. Usually when I do these problems, one doesn't match the others, and then you have to start looking, well, is it an error in your LT Spice, or is it an error in your theoretical solution? And then you know, a few hours later, you get it all straightened out, but that's the way it goes. All right, have a good weekend. Oh.